we're going to change uh, directions and um, um, and talk about a, um, a, a neurological disorder that actually does not need any medications. So uh, it's not very common that we don't prescribe pills and medicine, but this is that kind of disease. So let's jump right into it. These are my disclosures with the three companies, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, the objectives of my presentation are to talk about terminology um, uh, in the field of functional neurological and functional movement disorders. Uh, how do you diagnose a functional movement disorder? Talk about phenomenology, which would be the videos that I will show, and then um, uh, look at some historic clues. Um, you know, fundamentally with, with most things in neurology, uh, whether it is Parkinson disease or multiple sclerosis or epilepsy, a history and physical are absolutely key. So we always fall back on talking to the patient and doing a thorough examination to find out what's going on. Um, what about the pathophysiology of functional movement disorders? This is a complex field and it has a significant overlay with neuropsychological um, uh, neuropsychological disorders, uh, some very novel radiological markers, uh, and uh, new terms that I actually had to learn uh, over time. Um, it, how do you treat functional movement disorders? And then if time permits, at least a couple cases. All right, so uh, my references are many in terms of uh, PDFs, but the Diagnostic Statistics uh, Manual um, 5 uh, from 2011, uh, the textbook Psychogenic Movement Disorders, and the course that I attended at University of Louisville in Kentucky in 2017, which introduced me to treatment of um, functional movement disorders, are actually three major sources from which I've derived material for this presentation. And you'll notice that I use the term functional movement disorders and not psychogenic although the textbook says psychogenic movement disorders, because we've sort of, re we've um, now transitioned to using functional, a term which was popularized in 2014, um, I think, yes, after the textbook came out. Um, historically, functional movement disorders are not new. Uh, there are a subset of functional neurological disorders. And looking back in Western medicine, we have a record in Western medicine. I don't know much about Eastern medicine uh, in terms of functional movement disorders, but they've been described since the BC to the AD era. They've been prevalent uh, for a very long time, but they've been called different things. Uh, hysteria, as we know, the whole wandering womb, uh, somewhat misogynistic idea um, that only women get functional movement disorders, which is incorrect. Although there is a higher proportion, there is maybe wandering um, whatever the equivalent of male, um, you know, uh, body parts uh, as well. Uh, dissociative um, uh, disorders were used in the mid-19th to 20th century, and this reflects the psychological treatment uh, that was prevalent during that time. Freud um, it called it conversion disorder in the late uh, 19th to the mid-20th century. This term was very popular. And it still is uh, in the DSM-5 conversion disorder is still used um, by neuropsychologists, psychiatrists, but not as much by, um, by neurologists, and there's a reason for that. And then Stan Fahn, who is uh, one of the gurus of movement disorders from Columbia University, proposed, let's call this psychogenic movement. Um, patients did not like the term. It had a stigma associated with it. Uh, you said psychogenic, and people, people thought that they were psycho. And uh, a lot of times, patients will tell you, what are you t trying to tell me? I'm psycho? Uh, you know, so is this, this term sort of fell out of favor. And in 2014, we all as a group somewhat decided, well, let's use functional movement disorders, not psychogenic. Because psychogenic movement disorders it basically uh, uh, you know, tries to portray the fact that we know the cause of the movement disorder is psychiatric, is psychological. We actually don't know that. Uh, it could be, but we don't know that. Functional movement disorder is widely accepted as, oh, it's interrupting function. 
So let's call it a functional movement disorder. But please don't ask me why it's not called a dysfunctional movement disorder, because people with this are quite dysfunctional. Um, but you know, apparently we do not want any negative connotations to the term. Um, we in the DSM-5 have now a classification um, that uses the term functional movement disorders or conversion. And DSM-4 was different. DSM-4 required that a psychiatric cause be present for the diagnosis of functional movement disorders, not so much in DSM-5, because we may not know the cause. It's, and it's reclassified under somatic symptom and related disorders. So when you open the DSM-5 to chapter whatever, you will see this as a, um, a subtype of somatic symptom and related disorders. Uh, the two other disorders classified under this criteria criteria are the um, are illness anxiety disorder and somatic symptom disorder with multiple uh, neurological and other constitutional symptoms. Um, functional neurological disorder um, it can have several subtypes, and functional movement disorder is one of the subtypes of functional neurological disorder. And I'm actually going to talk more about F. M as in Mary D, as, in a, as opposed to FN as in Nancy D, uh, because, you know, FND is a very, very large topic, and I'm going to distill it down to, you know, my area of a sort of um, a treatment. Um, a basically, functional neurological disorder uh, is described as clinical motor and sensory symptoms um, due to an unexplained illness um, that, or, or medically unexplained symptoms. They do not conform to any known medical uh, disorders. They cause significant dress, uh, distress, and there are various subtypes of it. And functional and uh, neurological disorders are actually quite prevalent in our neurology clinic. Uh, the incidence is about four to 12 per 100,000, but I suppose it's in the eye of the epidemiologist or the statistician and the person who is diagnosing these functional movement disorders, about four to five per 100,000. Uh, the overall prevalence is supposed to be about 50 over 100,000 at any given time, 60 to 75 percent more common in women that peak at age 35 to 50, but we always have people at the tail end of the bell curve receive them because of referral bias. We have a lot of elderly people with functional movement disorders as well. And there are at least 10, and I suspect more, have dual diagnoses. So it's not an all or none phenomenon, meaning someone with functional neurological disorders can have Parkinson's, can have Huntington's, uh, can have multiple sclerosis and epilepsy. Um, so they can have other conditions, and they actually do. Uh, th this is the conundrum of dual diagnoses that we uh, deal with in the neurology clinic. And they're expensive to the system, uh, the costs up there on the slide. These are the various subtypes of the functional neurological disorder category in DSM-5, and the one that I will be focusing on is the abnormal movement category called functional movement disorders. And um, there is actually an ICD-10 code for functional movement disorder, which is F44.4, so which is a good thing because, you know, our revenues are dependent on appropriate coding and billing and all that. Uh, this is a slide that some of us have seen. You know, again, I feel that it is a little misogynistic uh, because you have this woman sort of swooning into the arms of Charcot, and he's trying to tell all his, I think, male counterparts that, hey, look, this is a woman with a functional neurological disorder. So hence, maybe it just happens in women. But at that time, it was thought to, um, you know, it was uh, supposed to be a weak womb kind of a theory, many, many different theories. So she was probably having functional syncope. Um, um, but, uh, you know, they were actually at the beginnings of trying to understand why uh, functional movement disorders and functional neurological disorders occurred. Um, now the field has moved forward, as we will see, significantly with radiological markers, etc. cetera. Um, so FMD, as we've already talked about, is a functional neurological disorder with abnormal movements causing significant stress, and the diagnosis is really dependent upon phenomenology or the kind of movements someone is having. 
What are the kind of movements someone can have with functional movement disorder? Actually, anything that anyone can have with movement disorders. Functional move, uh, movement disorders can mimic tremors, functional Parkinsonism, functional dystonia, functional gait problems, and speech, Korea, and a whole bunch. Uh, for, for the sake of the stock and for brevity, I'd be focusing on the first five. And we'll jump right into phenomenology and the videos, and I hope you can um, see the videos. And I'll play the video on the left side over here. Now, what, what I want you to notice is the frequency of the tremor that she has and how it changes. That's called entrainment. It changes with contralateral activation. That shouldn't happen in a, in a movement disorder tremor like essential tremor or um, a Parkinsonian tremor. Right, so that, that, that's important, you know, the, the gentleman is distracting the woman or activating the contralateral site. And now the phenomenology changes. Now she's having her count slowly. I don't have audio here. I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> that's, and you keep on tapping. So that's classic entrainment, you know, that's, that's a very good sign. This here is a functional tremor which is physiologically impossible to, uh, to produce if you have Parkinson's or essential tremor. Oh, sorry, this one here. And that maneuver you talked about today earlier that can set off the tremors in your legs, can you show me how that happens? Very fast. Uh, variable frequency uh, tremors and then the tremor spreads to the torso the arms it's not just a leg tremor the spreading phenomenology is another clue to a functional tremor now it's a flexion extension tremor a little different from the original tremor you saw And again, variable frequency, uh, and that's important to recognize. Good, a little bit slower. All right, a little bit slower. Frequency changes as she's activating. A very good clue as to the functionality. Some entrainment there. And then the tremor picks up. So those are very good signs. The two very fundamental signs uh, of functional movement disorders are distractibility and trainability, varying frequency if there is a tremor. But uh, there needn't always be a tremor, as we'll see. Uh, this is an example of actual truncal dystonia. This person has a monogenic gene, a genetic condition that causes a severe truncal dystonia. Has severe dystonia. Um, what you notice over here is a stereotypic pattern. His trunk is not going from one direction to the other. If you're an anatomist and you're looking at this trunk, you could say, oh, the right-sided axial muscles, the, the right spleno, uh, sternocleidomastoid, the right splenius capitis are highly active. Um, the, the previous part when, um, was before deep brain, the latter part is with deep brain. He hasn't gotten a very good benefit, but what you can see is a stereotypical pattern, which is very important for dystonia. And I contrast it to this video here. Initially stereotypic, but it varies. It's very slow and there are numerous muscles that are involved. Then she looks up in the opposite direction, which is not characteristic of dystonia. The direction changes, and she shrugs her shoulder, and the arm goes up, then her arm goes behind the shoulder. The phenomenology is very variable throughout the, the video, and that's important to recognize. And then she turns to the left, sometimes to the right. Now you can have mobile dystonia that can mimic this, um, but it doesn't vary so much. It is persistent. 
uh, you can't distract it all the time. So distractibility is not always present. When present, it is helpful. <clears throat> And that is a very classic, aesthetic, a basic gait, very uneconomical. And when she's walking, she does not have the stereotypical movements to the, the right. They go away. She's having a different kind of movement, which causes backward posturing. Again, the phenomenology is varying. It's almost like she's forgotten she had the other movement. Very erratic walk, trunkle swaying from side to side, catches herself beautifully, uh, which is typically not the case when you have a, a neurological disorder that disrupts gait significantly. So that the, when you put the constellation of those symptoms together, you arrive at a functional phenomenology. <clears throat> um, this is an example of startle myoclonus. This person actually has a gene that causes excessive startle. Now, it doesn't have to be very dramatic. Uh, it is just a mild truncal flexion. Uh, this woman has a gene that causes myoclonus and startle, but she's on clonazepam, so it's partially treated. These are very subtle movements that do not attenuate. abduction of thighs. So it's continuous, persistent, does not attenuate, subtle, not dramatic, and compared to this video here. Sometimes we call this the hallelujah pose. Um, but... Um, so it's very dramatic. Um, she's hyperextending her back, and it's slower than typical myoclonus. And really, startle is not that dramatic. And so those are the things we put together in addition to the history to say, oh, yeah, this is a functional startle. It's not classical for a, um, for a startle that is stimulus sensitive. The um, extension of the arm also varies. It's not very stereotypic. So those are two examples of functional myoclonus, and here's, a, here's an example of functional gait. Might fast forward a little bit, in the interest of time. If you really had such a severe tremor, it's a highly economical gait, he, you know, of course he needs assistance because there is someone else out there to assist him. Um, very wide-based, very erratic. And he is at a risk for fall, so you want to be close to him. Um, the gait doesn't automatically improve just because you're moving sideways. In fact, it's very difficult to move sideways if you have a neurological gait like ataxia, etc. Moving backwards, very difficult in neurological disorders. And he's able to accomplish that with his uh, trunk flexed. Knee buckling is another uh, good clue for a functional gait. Okay, let's look at another case to see what this is all about. This is a wide-based gate. Um, see what happens when they're trying to narrow the base and making her walk heel to toe if they do that. Okay, we don't do this anymore. Um, carbidopa is that inert uh, medicine in levodopa that shouldn't improve gait or improve anything. Um, so we, we don't do these fake outs anymore. It's unethical uh, to tell people, that I'm going to give you something that completely normalizes your gait, and she's walking beautifully. So um, this we don't do anymore. 
Anyway, so this is uh, not the best example of a uh, functional gait, I suppose, but it tells you that, oh, it can happen. Um, all right, this is, this is actual Parkinsonism. This woman has decrement of finger taps and amplitude as time goes by. I'll play it again because it's a short video of here. And you see that over time, the amplitude reduces as does the velocity. That's what we see in Parkinsonism. There needs to be a gradual decrement. And look at this. This is called anamnesis. That is really not Parkinsonism. The truncal movement and that extremely effortful tapping of fingers. Most people with Parkinson actually want to give you very good effort and show what they're doing. They, they are not so fatigued with just simple finger taps. So anamnesis is having disability significantly out of proportion to what's going on. A difference between functional bradykinesia and real bradykinesia or Parkinsonian bradykinesia. All right, so we saw the phenomenology. What about the historic clues that uh, alert us to a functional movement disorder? Sudden abrupt onset. Now, stroke, strokes can also have a sudden abrupt onset, but they don't cause um, abnormal hyperkinetic movements. Uh, so that's important to recognize. Spontaneous remissions. Oh, yeah, I've had this for two years, but oh, two months ago it went away completely, and then it came back, you know, two weeks ago. So I'm really concerned that I may be having uh, recurrent uh, illness. Um, that typically doesn't happen in many neurological diseases. You're not suddenly cured of all of your neurological symptoms. Psychiatric comorbidities are common in people with functional movement disorders, uh, such as depression and anxiety. And if there is untreated depression and anxiety, historic clue, it's uh, not very specific. What about trauma? abuse, we ask about these because we know that there is a correlation. And then a whole bunch of other somatic symptoms. If you look at the review of systems for, uh, for, for uh, people in people with functional movement disorders, you'll see almost everything is checked off, but there's really no diagnosis. So you know, how can you have every system that is um, involved but really not a known diagnosis that is causing your problems? These in isolation can be present in other illnesses, but it's a constellation of these clues. Tremor, as we saw, could be distractible, entrainable, variable in frequency. Dystonia can be distractible. You can have fixed postures in dystonia, and you know that we've seen a fixed flexed foot invert. That's usually not dystonia because there needs to be some mobility unless you have a contraction. We saw that non-pattern movement with the woman, the trunk going one way, the trunk going the other way. Um, that, that is a functional dystonia. Myoclonus is usually the fastest movement disorder we have. Quick very quick, very short, very fast. It's not dramatic. It doesn't cause wide fluctuations of various muscles. Uh, vocalizations we've seen with, with functional movement disorders or functional myoclonus, they're not always present. Full body jerks. Usually myoclonus does not cause full body jer jerks. It cannot, spontaneous cortical brainstem or subcortical myoclonus can only recruit so many muscles neurophysiologically, not the entire body. Um, Parkinsonism, we saw the, the example of anamnesis. A few other uh, uh, clues over here, easy exhaustion. People with Parkinson disease don't have a wide-based gait. This is important to recognize. People with ataxia do. Uh, do. Uh, so someone is very slow, very effortful, but has a wide-based gait. Something is not right. Um, uneconomic postures, we saw that. And a mixed features, sometimes tremors, sometimes dystonia, sometimes ataxia coming out during the walking knee buckling, we talked about that, exaggerated compensatory maneuvers or uneconomic gait. Um, and then otherwise a normal neurological examination. Also variability of phenomena because a return visit for me is important to see, well, you had dystonia and myoclonus the first visit, now you're having ataxia and tremor. How is that possible? So this varying phenomenology is important to also keep in mind in the recognition of functional movement disorders. What about the diagnosis ultimately, where you have to put the neurological signs and symptoms together to make the diagnosis? Some of these other neurological signs uh, can occur stuttering, baby talk, 
uh, give way weakness. Hoover sign is false weakness, uh, which I'm sure people in the emergency room and a neuro hospital is always check for. Um, delayed exaggeration, you're tapping a reflex, and then after a second you see the leg go up. That is a good sign to, uh, to look out for. Extreme emotionality at doing simple things. Can you please tap? Oh, I can't, and then there is a flood of tears. That usually does not happen with Parkinson's disease. And then inconsistency between visits we talked about. What about testing? Well, this cartoon sort of tells us that we don't need to order a whole bunch of tests. The doctor says, offhand, I'd say you're suffering from an arrow through your head, but just to play it safe, I'm ordering a bunch of tests. Well, you try not to... It's, all, it's not always this clear. This is, of course, a caricature of life. This is not, it's not always clear. I also order tests because of dual diagnoses. Um, so this is important. As I said, there are other neurological conditions that can be present. Um, what, what are the most common investigations? Someone comes to your clinic, a young kid, 17, coming to the clinic with dystonia and tremor you know, shivering, also has neuropsychiatric problems and a whole bunch of other things. You're like, my gosh, you've got a lot of things going on. Is this Wilson's disease? You know, the fundamental thing is, so at least let's get a brain MRI to make sure there's not something else going on. Um, you know, you can have Wilson's disease and functional movement disorder. So this whole Occam's razor thing goes out the window in some of our clinics. I don't typically order a lot of electrophysiology unless someone also has a terrible neuropathy and back pain, I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's get to the bottom of what's going on with this other thing which is causing you distress. DAT scans, I've ordered them when there is a clinically uncertain Parkinsonian syndrome, when people have had Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism, it's very difficult to separate the two. And, you know, a whole bunch of other life stressors. You're like, what is going on over here? You also have musculoskeletal problems and orthopedic problems. And just very quickly, a DAT scan looks like this. It uh, looks at the uh, connectivity uh, between the striatum and the, um, the neurons that innervate it through the dopamine transporter on your you see the normal scan looks like nice commas. Abnormal scans look like that. So that, that allows you to recognize, oh, the commas and you, your, your neurological signs are suggestive of a functional Parkinsonism. I put two and two together, I've got more evidence that this is functional Parkinsonism. It doesn't work for the other movement disorders, it's specifically for Parkinsonism. So this little study that was done in 2014 showed that, that, that people, movement disorders folks, gave the diagnosis of functional Parkinsonism to 14 people, but after the scan was done, seven were found to have true Parkinson's disease per the scan. So uh, even in the best of hands, even in movement disorders clinic, the error rate of diagnosis is at least 30 to 35 percent per neuropathological studies. Risk factors for functional movement disorders, higher rates of mood disorder are prevalent. Uh, at least 60 to 70 percent of the people have them. Childhood trauma, modeling behavior, someone else in the family has epilepsy or tremor, and you have the right mix of biopsychosocial stressors, and you, lo and behold, you develop a tremor. Uh, what about genetic markers? Not really clear. Uh, and neurophysiological markers, we, we don't know. We have talk about um, um, uh, 10 minutes, thank you. Uh, talk about uh, radiological markers that we will see, but we don't know if it's the cause or effect. The biopsychosocial hypothesis, and this is not a term I made up, this is actually there in the literature, suggests that there are multiple internal external factors that can give genesis to functional movement disorders. And they're listed over here. I don't have to read them all. Life events, maladaptive learning, biological vulnerability, hormonal influences, the giving rise to the female to male ratio. This is a beautiful slide of the human connectome, which is part of the NIH project tells me that I need to transition into giving you some mind-numbing facts on the radiological markers for f functional movement disorders. This is a complex field, but a lot of studies have now shown that the amygdala, particularly the right amygdala, the emotional processing center, is abnormal in functional movement disorders. And as a result of this amygdala being abnormal, 
the connection between the amygdala and the sensory motor cortex is abnormal. And this has consistently been seen through its small groups of people with functional movement disorders. So now finally we can say, oh, there's a biomarker. I can explain this to the patient saying, your right amygdala is not really working well. And it's not really connected to the SMA. This is a brain disorder. It's a network problem, you know. And I can actually say more than, oh, it's just stress, you know. You got a lot of stress in your life. And the patient's like, I have no stress. Look at me. I'm cool as a cucumber. But they're definitely receptive to the, to the idea of their right amygdala not working really well. Uh, you know, so um, we, we have something to at least now say, yes, there's a neural network problem. We suspected that. Uh, more uh, a, a functional MRI pictures that show that right amygdala and the right temporoparietal junction have abnormal connectivity. Self-agency is the ability to have insight into the fact that I can control my movements. I can stop doing this annoying thing that I'm doing here and put it down. And people with functional movement disorders, that, that self perception of self-control is gone. They think that the movements are externally derived. They have no control over them. Uh, we'll quickly go through some of the slides to get to the end. So ultimately, we have a model that shows limbic, pra limbic circuits and cortical output circuits. These two are not interacting well. So you say, you know, okay, why should I care? Big deal. Well, you have, we must because this does impair quality of life. That's important. The quality of life in functional movement disorders for this slide is impacted as much as in Parkinson's disease and sometimes more than in dystonia. That's the sum of this slide. How do you treat it? Well, we need a multidisciplinary approach, and this model tells you that you need a team approach. In Swedish, we have Suzanne Eller and the rehabilitation team that has helped us significantly in the, um, the treatment of functional movement disorders. Um, nonetheless, the treatment starts with a neurologist. This slide has a video that actually says, well, how do I explain this to the patient? The video is partly in German and in English, and it's a good explanation for what to tell people with functional movement disorders. Destigmatize the symptoms, listen attentively, give them resources, uh, you know, pretend don't pretend like, yeah, you've seen this before. You know, stop typing, turn, listen, and say, wow, really? That's going on? That's really disabled? You've been to the ER 40 times? I'm the 10th neurologist you're seeing. That is that is actually very bad. But it happens very common, commonly. So, you know, you have to be, lis uh, um, listen attentively, be compassionate, and, you know, think analytically. That's really important. Um, two modalities for treatment of functional movement disorder, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and we don't have to go through this entire slide, but there are self-help workbooks that Susanna uses with her patients, and I'll be happy to make PDFs of these slides and send them out so you don't have to take um, copious notes. Hypnosis is not used very commonly, and it's not available very commonly. Neural rehabilitation is absolutely key. And it's called motor retraining. So we work with our physical therapists to retrain the brain. Mayo Clinic and University of Louisville actually showed that this can be very effective. The predictors of good outcomes are female gender, mood well treated, pain is well treated, accepting of the diagnosis. Spells are not once a month. They're actually daily spells. Once a month spells are hard to rehabilitate. And not a whole lot of somatic symptoms, dizziness, vertigo, etc. This is a 56-year-old gentleman who had numerous medical problems, including myelodysplastic syndrome and everything that you see. He was seen everywhere, University of Washington, here or there, etc. For four years, he was struggling, and he came to us, and this is his video. Although my time is running out, I think it'd be worth looking at the last two videos. Um, <clears throat> Is, uh, is it, this, these movements are going to varying in severity and frequency, particularly with contralateral tapping. And uh, you will see that as other arm also starts to shake. Um, the foot is what I'm actually looking at to see if it changes in phenomenology. Now his right hand starts to shake as he lifts his left leg. The tremor in the right leg goes away, then comes back. Stuttering, stopping, tremor. Um, and I'm going to move forward a little bit. Uh, oh, this gait, very good. So he's got this um, uneconomical gait. He came in in a wheelchair. He was not able to walk appropriately. 
Um, he has this tremor again. Now it moved to his left hand uh, from his right hand. The right hand tremor varies in frequency. So there are many, many clues over here, and this was post-treatment, about two to three months. Um, almost all the symptoms went away with intensive motor retraining and cognitive behavioral therapy. He has some adventitious movements of his right foot, but they're not persistent, they're not tremulous, and he doesn't have them with, with his left hand. So he almost looks like a new man. Um, and he's walking, no wheelchair, uh, absolutely, completely. This is what in neurology we'd call a cure. There are not a lot of conditions that we can cure 100%. This is a good video to actually demonstrate the effectiveness of uh, these treatments, provided the patient is compliant, accepting of the diagnosis, comes back for treatment. So there are lots of prerequisites to, to a good outcome. He's happy now. He still has the myelodysplastic syndrome and all of that going on. Uh, last video, uh, just a minute, is a 25-year-old gentleman who came from Madigan. Uh, he wanted to be deployed, but he was so bothered by a tongue tremor, difficulty speaking, um, and a whole bunch of these throat things going on for one and a half years that he was miserable. Um, so he was sent to us for an evaluation to, to treat his tongue problems. And this is what we saw when he came to us. So every time I stick my tongue out, it shakes. Uh, it bothers um, me significantly. I get tired. Um, uh, I cannot speak. My throat hurts. Um, and this is what is preventing me from being deployed. And I really want to be, you know, he was a radio operator. As so when he's doing these movements, you see how his tongue frequency, the tremor varies, changes. Uh, and you will see that as it entrains and it slows down as his finger taps go down. So there's some entrainability, some distractibility going on, and those are two good clues. He did not have a lot of psychological stress that he, uh, that he actually said, oh, you know, this is what's bothering me. He said, no, things are going fine overall. He does not have a palatal tremor. That's what I'm looking for. Again, varying frequency. And this is post-treatment with Susanna and with speech therapists over here. Um, I'm looking for any adventitious movements at rest. I don't see any. I think I might have a bit. And I want you to open your mouth and stick your tongue out like you did earlier. And then move it from side to side as fast as you can. Good. And just open your mouth and let it rest in your mouth. And relax. Now, again, stick your tongue out, again, and with your right hand, do this for me as fast as you can, big and bold, and relax. Left hand, do the same thing, fast as you can, and relax, good, and you can, uh, so tongue problems are okay now? Yes. Eating, drinking, swallowing? Yes. All okay? Yes. Speech feels okay to you? Yes, it does. All right, so this, uh, you know, and then he's, he's going off to be deployed, and he's happy, and that's another person we cured. There are a few other examples. Well, finally, in summary, the clinical signs are the most relevant diagnostic test for functional movement disorders. Extensive testing is usually not necessary. The treatment starts um, at diagnosis, but the messaging should be absolutely clear. Um, a team-based approach is necessary for the treatment of functional movement disorders, and then comorbidities such as depression, anxiety, and pain should be treated effectively. Um, sorry to go over time, but I showed a lot of videos, Dr. Gierke. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>